بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد خاتم النبيين وإمام المرسلين جدد الله به رسالة السماء وأحيا ببعثته سنة الأنبياء ونشر بدعوته آيات الهداية وأتم به مكارم الأخلاق وعلى آله وأصحابه الذين فقههم الله في دينه فدعوا إلى سبيل ربهم بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة فهد الله بهم العباد وفتح على أيديهم البلاد وجعلهم أمة يهدون بالحق إلى الحق تحقيقا لسابق وعده وعد الله الذين آمنوا منكم وعملوا الصالحات لا يستخلفنهم في الأرض كما استخلف الذين من قبلهم ولا يمكنن لهم دينهم الذي ارتضى لهم ولا يبدلنهم من بعد خوفهم أمنا يعبدونني لا يشركون بي شيئا ومن كفر بعد ذلك فأولئك هم الفاسقون My dear respected علماء elders brothers sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all of you. You've been sitting here for a very, very long time and you've still got to sit here for a bit longer. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for your patience. Give you steadfastness in your sitting. Make it comfortable for you. And everything that you may have left behind, every activity or any responsibility that you had or something else that you should have been doing but you've sacrificed it to come here to listen to uh, all of these inspirational speakers I'm just a messenger so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you so much barakah in your time all of us so much barakah in our time that we're able to finish those things off that we could have been doing today good things that we could have been doing today may Allah give us barakah in our time so that we can finish those things off quickly as well There's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which he mentions that anybody who recites the Qur'an and he recites so much Qur'an that it occupies him from even making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everybody else is making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his love for the Qur'an is such that he just continues to read and read read the Qur'an. The hadith mentions Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Allah will give him the best of what he will give to anybody else who's asking. So he doesn't even have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will give him the best of what everybody else is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah knows what is the best for us. Even more than what we can ask for, He knows what's better for us. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the best for sitting here for so many hours and accept this sacrifice. What I'm supposed to be speaking about today is the ulul albab. Now this is something, if you recite the Qur'an, you'll hear it 14, 15 times in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the ulul albab. It can be translated in a number of ways. Ulul albab, the people of reason, the people of intellect, the people of... I told you this mic doesn't like me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an numerous times uses this word. إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُولُو albab. Only the people of understanding, the people with reason, the people with intellect, prudence, a pure mind, pure insight, intuition, only those people will take a lesson, will take heed, will reflect and do something that is to their benefit. Many of us pass by verses of the Quran and we don't do anything about it. Sometimes they touch us. These verses, they affect us. That's if we even read it with the meaning. One of the problems that the majority of us sitting here have who are from the Indo-Pak subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, or anybody essentially who doesn't understand Arabic, right? which includes our Moroccan brothers here who, uh, who are those that don't understand Arabic. So we're all in the same boat here. When we read the Quran, we don't understand it, which is really a sad, sad fact. It's, it's really sad. And I think we need to do something about it. 
if you don't have the time to learn Arabic, then at least what you can do is to take a translation or a commentary of the Quran and read some of that. What normally what I say, what I normally encourage people to do is that if you're reciting if you're reciting Quran for an hour a day, let's just say that that is your wadifa, that is your regimen a day, you're reciting Quran for an hour. What I suggest is that you continue reading, but for 50% of that time, recite the Quran. <coughs> recite. Just reading. Right? Like you do in Ramadan, you just read, you just read, you know, try to finish the Quran so many times in a year. But for 25% of the time, try to memorize something. So for 25%, which will mean 15 minutes, try to memorize something. Try to re-memorize anything that you've memorized before and you've forgotten. So if you knew Yasin before, you knew Wal Fajr, you knew Amma Yatasa'alun, well try to re-memorize that. Now, don't be deceived. Every letter that you read, even if it's the same ayah and verse that you're reading over and over again, you'll be getting the equivalent reward to reading other verses just throughout. Because it's in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards by letters, 10 per letter. So if you're saying, you will be rewarded for every single letter you read, even though it's the same ayah that you're repeating over and over again. There'll be an additional benefit to this, which is that this will become recorded in your brain, in your mind, so that you can actually recall it and don't need to have the Mus'haf and the Quran in front of you in the future to recite it from. So that's the additional benefit. So you will not get any less benefit or reward in trying to memorize. In fact, you'll get more because you'll probably read faster the more you read it and repeat it and then you'll memorize it and that is how much higher you'll get into paradise as well as the, the famous hadith mentions read and climb and ascend and your last place your place that your destination is where you will end your reading and believe me every one of us can do something at least Re learn Surah Yasin, Surah Tabar, Surah Al-Mulk uh, other surahs the, um, the, the last uh, many of the surahs at the, at the end of the Quran right so that was the other 25% now you have another 25% of time. That 25% we take to ponder. So the last 25% of our time, 15 minutes from the one hour, take a tafsir, a good translation and just ponder over what you read. Just ponder over what you read. Don't they ponder over the Quran? So that is extremely important. Now, ulul albab. Ulu means those who possess. Albab is the plural of lub. Lub means the most clarified part of something, the essence of something. So, for example, you have the lub, the actual wheat kernel inside. After you remove the skin and the shaft, then you have what's inside. That's called the lub. Likewise with our brain, the various different things that we do with our brain, our intellect, our reason, our heart, all of this is included. Because according to Islamic scholars and according to the Islamic worldview and understanding of the physical and physiological makeup of the human being and the cardiac understanding of the heart, the heart is the, heart is the origin of the aql and the intellect and it goes through the brain. So it's not just the brain but it's the heart as well. It's the heart as well. So now, ulul albab, the people with the pure heart. So lub, according to, for example, what uh, Lane explains, he says it's the pure or the choicest, the best part of something. The understanding, the intellect, the intelligence. Now think about this. Another thing that he says is that the lub part of the heart and a person's understanding is called that because it is the best part of him and it is pure from lust and foul imaginations. So now we need to think to ourselves that what kind of a heart do we have? What kind of an understanding and reason do we have? Is it pure or is it adulterated with thoughts? Are they, is it a, a receptacle of evil thoughts that come into it? See, there's a difference between just being very smart, very clever, very quick. For example, it's related about one of the sheikhs of Azhar. 
he once went to this uh, he, he once went to this conference with some Christians and Jews, so it's probably some kind of interfaith conference. It took a very long time for him to get there. Shaykh al Azhar, this is uh, one of the high positions. There's two positions in Egypt. One, you have the Shaykh of Azhar, who is, you can say, the rector uh, of the Azhar uh, uh, University, and the other one is the Mufti of Egypt. So these are the two prominent positions that have been historically there. So the Shaykh al Azhar of his time is a very intellectual individual as well. So he went to this conference and when he got there, somebody offered him a glass of water because, and it was really hot and he just got there after a very long uh, traffic and uh, time and so on. So he took that glass, short, small glass, you know, and just gulped it down in one sip. So immediately there was a Christian man, uh, there was one of the Christian representatives there. He said to him, I thought you people, your sunnah, right, of your Prophet Muhammad wasallam, is that you should drink in three gulps, in three sips and not in one, one sip. So he knew a bit about Islam. So the Shaykh was very quick, he said, yeah, don't worry about it, I'm going to have two more cups. <laughs> right? Now that's, that's what you call being witty. It's not about Islamic, it's just being witty, alright? And then after that, the person wanted to challenge him. He says, oh, so you guys say that everything is in the Qur'an? And he said, uh, the Shaykh said, yes, of course, everything is in the Qur'an. He said, okay, fine. Now he started getting it a bit abs absurd, a bit ridiculous. He said, okay, you know this pot here which has the, the bread in it, how many slices are in there? What does your Qur'an say about that? He says, okay, the Shaykh said, um, can you give me a phone please? So they found one of the hotel phones and he called up the kitchen and he said, can, I have, can, can you get me the cook please? So he said to the cook, you know, there, there's uh, the, the bread basket that you've served there. How many pieces of bread are in there? He says, okay, there's this many slices. So then he turned around to the other person, uh, to the, uh, the representative and he said, oh, there's this many slices. He said, no, I wanted an answer from the Qur'an. He says, I did give you an answer from the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. <laughs> so the most knowledgeable person about these rotis, these chapatis, is the cook. So I asked him. And then the person said, um, Is my name in the Qur'an? He said, what's your name? He said, my name is Cook. No, cook, cook, right? Something like that. He said, yes, absolutely, it's in the Qur'an. And he read the verse. فَإِذَا رَأُوا تِجَارَةً إِنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكْ وَتَرَكُوكْ This is in Surah Al-Jumu'ah. When one day what happened is, they were all waiting there in Salat time, and the booty came and they were really hungry, they were really in a dire state. So they, many of the Sahaba, they went. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals, وَتَرَكُوكَ قَائِمَا And they left you standing. تَرَكُوكَ تَرَكُوكَ He said, yes, there. So the person then became silent. How many more things is he going to do? That's being witty. Now clearly this man, the, the Shaykh of Azhar was no doubt also an, a person of intellect, understanding in all the senses of that word. Right, bro, from a worldly sense and the real ukhrawi sense that matters. And that's when it gets most beautiful. When you have somebody who's really understanding of everything, that is, that is when it gets most beautiful. Otherwise, it's not about smartness. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you're at UCL or Kings, whether you're at Imperial College, whether you are at Metropolitan University, East London University or whatever they're called. It doesn't matter or so as or wherever you are, it doesn't matter. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give that understanding and that reason to somebody, then it does not require that kind of wittiness. Because this kind of intellect, al-bab, the lub that is required for the hereafter is something different. It's the ability, according to many of the mufassireen, when they do tafsir of this verse, the ability to distinguish in the good and the bad. You see, we know that when we sit down in a gathering, we're going to hear good things, pure things. We're going to hear redundant things. We're going to hear futile things. We're going to hear maybe even haram things, immoral things. The ability for you not to be influenced by the bad and the corrupt, regardless of where you are, and to be influenced only by the good and the pure. And then to convey from there the good and to abstain from conveying the evil. 
That is just one aspect of being ulul albab and understanding. Can you distinguish between good and bad? Between what you see and what you do not see? I'll give you an example. You're watching TV. Right? I'm not encouraging it. It's just unfortunately something that many, many people do. You're watching TV. And in most programs, films, videos, movies, uh, serials, whatever, there's always an element of romance. So there is a guy who's trying to go after someone else, or a girl who's trying to go after someone else. Now you get so involved in this, you get, we become so involved in this, that let's just say that there's a case where somebody's trying to get this girl, or this girl is trying to get this guy, and finally they're like in the room, they're just about to do it. What does your heart say at that point in mind? At that point of time, what does your heart do? That is the question to ask. Forget about prohibiting the wrong. We get so involved, we're like, yeah, go on, get it, go, go for it. <laughs> that is really sad. You know, if that is our case, and if that's how we're feeling, and you know, like uh, many women get very emotional about this, like, oh, you know, if you get emotional like that, you're like, oh, so sweet, you know, and that kind of stuff. <coughs> Seriously, we have to question our Iman. We have to question our Iman. Because there's a, the hadith is very clear. It says when you see something wrong, you should st stop it with your hands. If you can't stop it with your hands, then you stop it with your tongue. And if you can't do that, where are you going to go and stop these movies with your hand and your tongue? Right? The minimum that you must do is at least to think bad of it. So really we must be thinking, no, 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 no. You shouldn't be doing that. Haram. Right? So... Otherwise, and the Prophet ﷺ then said, وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفُ iman." That state where you can at least just think bad about it, that is the weakest state of Iman. I don't want to make any judgments about our Iman. I don't want to make any judgments about anybody's Iman. That's a dangerous thing to do. But it is something that we all need to introspect, reflect about. Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, he once with his, with his students, they were going to the masjid. And they came across, uh, they were going past a, 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 a river or a stream or something, and they found this young boy, a young boy, subhanAllah. And what was interesting is, he was there making wudu. Number one, is a young guy, young boy, making wudu. This is how people made wudu in those days, right? He made wudu and he was weeping. He was weeping really intensely. So the Imam Abu Hanifa, he stopped because this was like, why is he crying for? He's making wudu and he's crying. So he's not just sitting kind of on the side and crying, but he's sitting there crying like that. So why is he crying? So Imam Abu Hanifa, he went up to him and he said to him, why are you crying for? So he said, da'ni wa sha'ni. Leave me, you know, leave me to it. You, you can understand the intelligence. Just leave me to it. I don't want to respond. It's my problem. Da'ni wa sha'ni. Leave me with my state. So then, Imam Abu Hanifa insisted. He wanted to find out. He was curious. Why is he crying for? What's the problem? Maybe he could help him. So he ins persisted on him. And finally, he said, the, the, this young kid, he said, I've just read in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Al-Tahreem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ فَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي فَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ أُعِدَّتْ Lil Kafirin. Beware of the fire. Be fearful of the fire. That such a fire whose fuel are people and stones. What kind of a fire is that? It wants it doesn't it doesn't work with anything but stones and people, which has been prepared for the disbelievers. And that is making me cry. Young kid, affected by that verse. We are 30, 40, and we're not affected by that. We can't think about that. That we're also going to meet the same fate. We're also going to have to go over this hellfire and maybe enter into it. May Allah give us the insight. May Allah give us the basira to think of these things. So, Imam Abu Hanifa tried to calm him down. He tried to console him. He said, Ya Bunayya, ma zilta sagheeran. My son, you're still young. Why are you so worried? It's surprising. See a nine, ten year old kid crying like that over a verse. Where would you see that? He said, Oh my son, you're still young. 
you're still young. And this verse doesn't apply to you. The only time, the only way he could have said this to him is if he was not even an adolescent yet, if he was not Balid. Because if he was 15, 16 years old, then obviously this verse applies. Because now you're mukallaf, you are responsible. Everything we do is being counted against us or for us. So he must have been very young. That proves that he was very young. He said, you're still young. And this verse doesn't apply to you. It doesn't apply to you. You know what the... Look at the thought of this child. Subhanallah. May Allah give us such thoughts. Look at the insight of this child. Ulul al-bab at a young age. He says, but isn't it that when we make a fire, that we put the small sticks in first, and then you put the big logs in? So he's, for him it's like, I'm going to be also a fuel for the fire. Small, I'm the small ones, we're going to be thrown in there first. That is what you call people who it touches. What kind of an upbringing must this child have had? May Allah give us all the parents among us. May Allah give us the ability to bring up our children so that they can think along these lines. Along these lines. Then they will help us inshallah to get to the hereafter. And it will help. Because then we won't have to deal with it when they grow older that they're thinking in a different way. So, Ulul Al-Bab does not refer to wittiness. It refers to an understanding that you can see the truth from the wrong. Truth from falsehood. You can see what is beneficial for you from what is not beneficial for you. You know, there are so many kids that, you know, when you see a gang of uh, youth, uh, young adults that are doing haram things, engaged in wrong things, whether it be drugs or whether it be just walking the streets looking for somebody to attack, or whatever the case is. If you study any group, you will always notice that there'll be one leader among those. The others are very simplistic minded. They just want to belong because they've had some problems in their life. They've got issues. They've got maybe nobody else to look up to or to relate to, to sympathize with, to a, cry, a shoulder to cry on. So this is the way they get negative in negative attraction. They're, they're looking for negative attention. This is what they do. I want, I want to be bad so that people at least look at me some way. If, it, if, they don't, if I can't do anything good and I'm never good, then at least they can be, I can be bad about it and people will look at me, right? And I'm, I'm used to being told off anyway. I'm used to being told off. So that doesn't make a difference. And it just gets worse and worse. A friend of mine works in a prison. Imam, chaplain, in a prison. And it was quite uh, one thing which I'd, been, which I'd had in my mind for a very long time and he confirmed it. He, uh, he works in a, a prison where light offenders come in, not murderers and stuff. Right, so these are not the worst of the worst. And in a prison of maybe uh, uh, 800 to 1,000 people, he says about 200 are Muslim. Right, so that's 20%. That's 20%, which is sad already, right? He said, I said, what was the one thing that really like shocked you or that really resonated with you, that really made you understand something? He says that there was one guy, he was in there for stealing. Uh, weird kind of shoplifting, stealing, pickpocketing, those kind of things. So I asked him how he came to that. And what touched me was that he blamed his mother. What touched it, uh, what touched the, the, the Imam, the, the, the chaplain, my friend, was the fact that this man was blaming his mother. Not because she was overly strict. Most of us have a problem with our parents because they're too strict. Where did you go? Make sure you're back on time. Make sure you're there. Where are you? Constantly calling on the phone. Make sure you take your phone. Make sure I know where you are, who you're going with, and all the rest of it. That's what we consider bad, right? That's what we consider bad and a, a bother, irritation, right? Like, what's wrong with you guys? That's what we think. Now for him, it was a different story. He said that I'm blaming my mother because what, what happened, this is where it started from. We would go to somebody's house. And I'm sure this has happened with all of us. You go to somebody's house as a, like a four-year-old, uh, four three-year-old kid. You like a toy that their kid has. So you pick it up and you want to walk out with it when you go home. Because you've been playing with it and you make it yours. You know, kids, what do they understand? This is mine, this is mine. No, it's all mine. Right? 
that's, that's the way they deal with it. So he wanted to walk out with it. Now what we normally tell our children, what your parents, our parents normally t- told us is, no, 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 you can't do that. It's not yours, it's his. Now, what generally will happen then, is that the host family, the one you're going to visit, they'll say, no, it's okay, they'll let them take it. It's just a small toy, it's alright, we'll get another one. Don't make him cry. They say all of these things. I insist, no. You put it back. It's a bad habit at the end of the day. You can't just pick things whenever you want. Tomorrow I won't be there to see it. Right? His mom, his mom wasn't really active. A single mother, that was the other problem. A single mother, that was the other problem. May Allah help the single mothers out there. Because really we should make dua for them. Right? And may Allah give them himma to do the job that they're required to do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala find them a suitable partner and give them lots of himma and strength. Because such women generally get into depression sometimes and then the children really have a major problem. So he said, my mother never said anything. She would just let me take it. So, you know, initially it was a little car, small car, whatever. And then eventually it became something big. And the family, out of embarrassment, they're not... I mean, I want to take your DS, please. Right? Now the family, imagine if a kid came to your house with his mom and he was going to take your, your DS. Right? Or some toy like that that you really... What, a PS, DS, whatever. Right? Something that you like. Your computer. Right? And... What are you going to say? What would you say to them? So, slowly, slowly, I started taking things and then I started taking things sort of, uh, secretly. Then I started pickpocketing. Then I had a, a sister who was uh, much younger than me. And uh, when she grew up old enough to go to school uh, and for me to take her, that was the worst day of my life. Because I would pickpocket on the way to school from these local shops. And now I have to look after my sister. She's going to find out. She's going to tell my mom. Right? But then I got over my sister. And I used to tell her to wait. And I would say, when you see me running, you run as well. Right? So this is how uh, she may have not, I don't know if she knew or not. But that's how. eventually one day he got caught. He got caught in a mall. And that's how he ended up in prison. And now he's sitting there thinking over it. He couldn't stop. He'd become like a kleptomaniac, in a sense. Kleptomaniacs are those people who have this urge to steal even though they don't need the product. It becomes a habit, an addiction as such. Essentially, that's maybe where he had reached. But he was blaming everything on his mother. Because it was at that level that it came, that that it started. And it continued and it festered. Now, we don't have much time. I want to just relate to us a very inspirational interaction an exchange that took place between two very prominent individuals right both of these we can learn from and inshallah we can really learn from because there's many things that we can relate to in this story inshallah this story is about a man who was considered the great alim of Medina Munawwara he was a tabi'i he had sat in the company of many many sahaba many companions so he lived in Medina Munawwara. His name was Salama ibn Dinar. Salama ibn Dinar. His, his, uh, his, uh, his title was Abu Hazim al-A'raj. Al-A'raj means the lame one. He had a, a problem with his, uh, with his leg. And so he was one of the greatest of the ulama and zuhad, the ascetics of Medina Munawwara. So while he was in Medina Munawwara, Sulaiman uh, ibn Abdul Malik, the Umayyad leader, the Umayyad Sultan, Khalif. He decided in the, 90, in, in the year 97 Hijri, just before the millennium, he decided to come and uh, to, for Umrah or Hajj. And then he came to uh, the Holy Lands, the sacred precincts. And there, when he got to Medina Munawwara, they set up camp, the royal camp was set up. So all of the important and distinguished people of Medina Munawwara came to visit him. This is what you do. This is the king is here. You go and visit all, especially all the distinguished people. They came to visit him and welcome him. When Abdul, when Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik finished. Now this is one of the most powerful men of the time, right? The Umayyads were extremely powerful, very indulgent. Sulaiman, in comparison to the others, was generally seemed to be better. He was the one that preceded Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He was the one whose children were too young to become the next Khalif. So when he was about to die, he tried to, they tried to dress his children up to make them look older so that they could be sworn in as the next Khalif, but it didn't work. And he had 
a very pious individual as his counselor next to him and he's whispered in his ear, your cousin, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. So he said, okay, fine. It was one of the best things that he did. Although generally speaking, he was better off than some of the others. Walid ibn Abdul Malik and the others. So when he came, after he'd finished greeting and meeting everybody, he said to some of his close ministers, he says, you know, the hearts, they become rusty. They become problematic. And sometimes you need somebody from time to time to give them nasiha, to remind them of the hereafter so that they become purified. See, this is a king speaking. This is a khalif who's got everything at his disposal. His heart has softened. He realizes I've got a problem in my heart. Allah give us that kind of thought for our heart as well. And I'm sure he has because that's why we're here. Inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautify our hearts with the words of his and with the words of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and illuminate it with his nur. So he says, is there anybody here that can come and speak to me? That can like really speak to me? So they said, yes, of course there is. They said, he said, isn't there anybody who's met the Sahaba? They must be people who are the most dignified and the most uh, appropriate for this kind of a task, who will come and give me some nasiha. He said, yes, Amir al-Mu'mineen, there is. There's Abu Hazim al-A'raj, he. So who is Abu Hazim al-A'raj? He said, oh, he's, they said, Salama ibn Dinar, he's the alim of Medina Munawwara. He's the, their great scholar. He's one of the tabi'een. He's met with many, many of the sahaba. Call him, but be nice when you call him. Don't summon him like the king's calling you. Be nice to him when you summon him. Bring him nicely. He had a job. He, had, he, had a, you know, he wanted to make him a request, so he had to be nice to him. When they came to him, they greeted him, and they called him, so he came. When he came to the majlis of the king, of the khalif, the king welcomed him, and then he said to him, now look at what he says to him. You've never met this guy before. And you say to him, man, what's wrong with you? Why don't you ever come to meet me? Why are you staying away for? You've never met somebody before, but you're like so free with them. You're saying, what's your problem, man? Why don't you come and visit me? And you're like, I don't even know you, <laughs> right? So, ma hadha al-jafa ya Abu Hazim? What is this estrangement? Why are you staying away, O Abu Hazim? So, Right from the beginning, now you should ponder over Abu Hazim's words because they will inshallah purify our hearts. He said, What are you jafa in ra'ayta minni, ya Amir al Mu'minin? What kind of estrangement, what kind of aversion have you noticed from me? I didn't avoid you. What kind of avoidance did you see of me, O Amir al Mu'minin? He said, Zarani wujuhun nas, walam dazurni. All of these important and dignified people of the area, distinguished men, they all visited me and you didn't visit me? So, this is his response. He didn't like, oh, oh okay, you know. He said, "Inna yakunul jafa ba'd al ma'rifah." You can only avoid somebody after you know them. Otherwise, it's not avoidance, right? If we knew each other, we met before, then then you could say that. Wa anta ma araftani qabla qabla al yom, wa la ana raaituk. You never even knew about me before this day, and I've never seen you before. So, fa ayu jafa in waqa aminni. So, what kind of avoidance has occurred? On, from me. So the Khalifa said, now the Khalifa, he wants, he wants him to benefit. So he turns around to everybody. Now, I'm sure there's people among the ministers and everything who are like, hey, what's, where's this going to? Right? Willing to just step in. Because that's what you have. They're, they're, they're more Khalif than the Khalif himself. Right? So he turned around. The Khalif turned around to his companions and he said, he's absolutely right in his excuse. He's absolutely right and the Khalifa is wrong. The Khalif is wrong. And then he turned around to Abu Hazim and he turned around to Abu Hazim and he said, There's some issues in my heart which I would like to disclose to you. I'd like to ask you about, consult you with. Hatiha ya Amir al Mu'minin, Wallahu al Musta'an. No problem. Mention them, O Amir al Mu'mineen. So he's polite. Allah, Allah will help us. So the Khalifa said, O oh Abu Hazim, the first question. Ma lana nakrahul maut. Now we should think about this. Do we dislike death? Meaning, have we even thought about death to dislike it? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. Seriously, that's the question I'll ask myself. 
Can I say I dislike death? I haven't even thought about it. How can I say I dislike it? The only person that can be talking about dislike is at least if they've got to the stage where they've realized I'm gonna die. They've understood their mortality. That I'm like everybody else has died before me, I'm also going to die. So clearly the Khalif was at that level, he says, Why is it that we dislike death? Look at the answer. He said, It's because we have inhabited, we have done up our dunya. And we have made desolate our hereafter. We haven't worked on our hereafter. We haven't put any money in our hereafter. We've done this house up. The house in Bangladesh, the house in India, there's, we haven't done anything, we just got a piece of land, if even that. فَنَقْرَهُ الْخُرُوجِ مِنَ الْعُمَّارِ إِلَى الْخَرَابِ Hence, we dislike to go from a nice built-up area to a place which is desolate. For example, a friend of mine went to Mauritania to study. And he said we had to live in tents, big, big insects, basic, basic food. Not many people are able to study there. You're able to study in a nice building, nice cozy rooms, all amenities, warm water, etc. This is worse than this. We've got the, by virtue of the fact that we are believers, we have a piece of land that has been given to us in paradise. Every one of us who is a believer has a piece of land in paradise. It is up to us to make it up or not. إِنَّهَا قِيْعَانٌ وَغَرَسُهَا It's crops. The way you build it up is by your Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, your Adhkar. Alhamdulillah, Allah has given us a piece of land to go to. The land is there. But what kind of a land is it going to be? That is why he said we... It's a desolate place. We haven't sent anything forward. That's why we dislike to go from this world. It's cozy. Why should we go? Sadaqta. He said you've told the absolute truth. He understood. This was coming from a ulul albab. And then he said, Ya Aba Hazim, what are we going to have? I'm concerned. What will be upon me? What is going to be our state in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tomorrow? So look at what Abu Hazim says. Fearless. Ulul albab. Understanding. Perfect insight. He says, A'rid. A'malaka ala kitabillahi azza wa jal. Take your actions that you've done. Put them in front of the book of Allah. Judge them in front of the book of Allah. And you'll find out what your, what your situation is. What's going to happen tomorrow. Let us do that. Our actions, put them in front of the book of Allah. Are we of the Muhsineen? Or the Musi'een? So Abu Hazim, uh, the Khalifi says, وَأَيْنَ أَجِدُهُ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ where, where, Which verse exactly are you speaking about? Where will I find this in the, in the book of Allah? So immediately Abu Hazim says, You will find it where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that verily the pious, righteous ones will be in bounties, will be in bliss. And the wrongdoers, the sinners, profligates, transgressors, they will be in the burning fire. So the Khalifa says, but where is the mercy of Allah then? فَأَيْنَ رَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ If that is the case, then what about the mercy of Allah? We've always been told about the mercy of Allah. So where's the mercy of Allah then? So Abu Hazim says, إِنَّ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ قَرِيبٌ مِّنَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, the verily the mercy of Allah is well nigh, well close to the people who do good. So if you do good, Allah's mercy is with you. Then the Khalifa says, لَيْتَ شَعْرِي كَيْفَ الْقُدُومُ عَلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ غَدًا How is our approach going to be towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tomorrow? Our confrontation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how will it be tomorrow? Abu Hazim then explained, he says, أَمَّا الْمُحْسِنْ As far as the doer of good, فَكَالْغَائِبِ يَقْدِمُ عَلَى أَهْلِهِ Then 
If it's a good person, it'll be like that man. Have you ever been on a trip for three, four weeks and you've eventually been tired out and now you just can't wait to get back home? And then you come to Heathrow on a seven hour flight and then there's traffic in London, which is always the case. That's one of the worst parts of our, my journey, right? Takes you two hours to get home and you just can't wait. You just can't wait. And when you have eventually get home, how good do you feel? How good do you feel? Right? How good do you feel? So he says, it's like the person who was absent, who's coming back to his family. That is how you will feel in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those. As though we're going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَمَّا الْمُسِيءِ فَكَلْ عَبْدِ الْهَارِبِ And as far as the bad person is concerned, then he is going to be like the one who is like the runaway slave who is now being caught and he's being forced and dragged back to his master. How does he feel? At that point, فَبَّكَ الْخَلِيفَةَ حَتَّى عَلَى نَحِيبُهُ وَاشْتَدَّ بُكَاؤُهُ This is when the Khalif began to cry in front of everybody. This is what I call a man. This is what I call a man despite whoever he was. He's in front of I mean, he's in front of all of his viziers, all of his companions, and he's starting to cry in front of them until his sobbing, his wailing, his lamenting became loud and intense. May Allah give us the tawfiq to even cry in private. Forget about in public. May Allah give us the tawfiq to put our hands up and cry even in private. Just within ourselves and when we know for ourselves and nobody else is watching. And then he said, Oh Abba Hazim, kayfa lana an nuslih? How can we now rectify ourselves? Which is the way to reform? He has ready answers and perfect answers. You will abandon all forms of arrogance. All that you have, so you're arrogant, abandon all arrogance. And embellish yourself, beautify yourself. With what? With decency, chivalry, generosity. Being a decent man when you deal with people. That's how you will rectify yourself. So any of us walk around as though we're it, as we say in England. Right? We walk around, even our gait is such. You know, you can just tell, there's some people and you think, yeah man, I used to do this before. Right? There's just the, the way they walk, they've got this special kind of gait, the way they walk. They just think that it. I don't know, maybe that attracts more women. It may just make them look bad or good or, you know, wicked, I don't know, whatever the, the uh, or, what's the other one? It's, and there's the, these, uh, these terms, they change every, sick. <laughs> that wasn't something that I used to use when I was young here. Wicked, I remember, but now it's sick. I mean, come on, can't you find something better? It's like trying to find the worst word to, for good, because it's not really good. It's what you make is good. And it's, it's, an, it's actually the perfect word, really, because it is really sick. You just think it's good. May Allah give us tawfiq. So, decency. Avoid arrogance. Then the Khalifa said, now the Khalifa is thinking, well, you know, where are my pitfalls? What are my problems? He says, okay, this wealth now. I've got lots of wealth. I mean, the Umayyads were known for their indulgence. They were known for their indulgence. Uh, Abbasids, in some cases, were not that far behind as well. On one occasion, on Eid day, you know, they had the royal possession. You know what time they made Eid Salat? After Maghrib. It took the whole day. So there's been some crazy thing that has happened in history. Right? He said, Masabilu ila taqwa Allahi fi. What is the way to have taqwa and the fear of Allah with regards to the wealth that we have? Abu Hazim said, as long as you take it with its right, as long as you're not confiscating, you know, undue right from others, usurping somebody else's wealth. As long as you're taking it with its right, and then you're distributing it in the right way, you're spending it in the right way, in its rightful place. And as long as you are, as long as you are fair and just when you treat people, then that is how you deal with your wealth. That's the haq of the wealth. Then the Khalifa says, Oh Abu Hazim, who is then the best of people? Man huwa afdalun nas, who's the best of people? He says, Ulu, ulul muru'ati wa tuqa, the people who have decency and chivalry and generosity and taqwa, they're the best of people. He then asked him a number of other questions. I want to get to the end, so I'm going to quickly just mention them. Then he says, Wama a'dalul qawli ya Aba Hazim, what is the most just speech? 
What is the most just statement, fair statement that you can make? This is what he says. كَلِمَةُ حَقٍ يَقُولُهَا الْمَرْءُ عِنْدَ مَنْ يَخَافُ The statement of truth that a person says and makes in front of the one who he is fearful of. Meaning, you're speaking truth in front of the one that can do something bad to you. The leader, the king, whatever it is. Absolutely fearless. Right? وَعِنْدَ مَنْ يَرْجُوهُ And to tell the truth in front of the one who you have some expectations from. Because if you tell them sometimes the truth, then they won't help you out. You have expectations from them. He's got it all figured out. See, these are, there was another man, there was another great scholar of Damascus, Ibn Izz, Ibn Ibn Abdi Salam. He had given this fatwa against some of the very prominent individuals in the ministry. So one, one day, they would, and he would not recant that fatwa. He would not take that fatwa back, even though the king of Egypt, uh, it was, uh, sorry, it was Egypt. Even though the king uh, told him uh, to, to recant and everything, he, would, he refused. And his fatwa was the fatwa. So one day, one of them decided that, look, I'm just going to finish him off. So he came and he knocked on the door and he had a sword in his hand. So the son uh, of Iz ibn Abdi Salam, rahimahullah, he went to open the door. And he saw the state and he says, call your father. So he was obviously fearful. He went and called his father. The, the father just went out. And as soon as he went out and this minister saw him, his hands began to tremble and the sword fell down. He said, what are you going to do with us now? Right? He says, I'm going to do exactly what my fatwa is. He says, okay, please deal with us with some compassion. That's, he'd come to kill him and now this, is, this was his response. The father said to the son, or the son said to him, weren't you afraid? I thought it was your last day. He says, no. Your father is not going to be blessed with having shahada here. He's not going to be blessed with having shahada here like this. Going back to Abu Hazim, then he asked him, what is the fastest dua to be accepted? So he said, the dua that a good person makes for other good people. Their duas are the fastest to be accepted because Allah recognizes them. Imam Nahlawi, he mentions, don't ask anybody for a, a loan. Because as the Arabic proverb says, Al-Qardu miqradu al-Mahabba. The debt, the loan, is the scissor. Is the scissor for love. Because eventually something goes wrong. And if you have to ask somebody, then it doesn't say ask your family members. It says ask a pious man. Ask a righteous person with taqwa. Why? Because if he has, he will give you. If he doesn't, he'll make dua for you at least. So, and he won't tell everybody about you. And if you can't repay him on time, then he will obviously not uh, bother you too much because he will recognize that it's sunnah to give time to people. That's the benefit of dealing with people of taqwa. <coughs> then Abu Hazim, he asks him, وَمَا أَفْضَلُ الصَّدَقَةِ What is the best type of sadaqah? He says, the best sadaqah is of the one who has the least, who's in trouble themselves. It's a small amount they're able to give because they have very little themselves. And he goes and puts it into the hand of a poor person who's in need without following it up with any kind of harm or any kind of reminder. Remember I gave you? I've been spending on you, I've been giving you sadaqah, I've been telling people to spend on you all this time. You need to do this for me? Right? None of that kind of attitude. Then the Khalifa said, who is the most intelligent of people, smartest of people are Abu Hazim. So this is what he said, Rajulun Zafara bi ta'ati ta'ala. The one who is successful by being obedient to, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he then acts on it and then he tells, he, he, te, he, he gives da'wah to others as well. That is, the most, that is the most intelligent person. Then the Khalifa said, فَمَنْ أَحْمَقُ nas, Who is the most foolish of people? So he said, now this one is important. رَجُلٌ إِنْ سَاقَ مَعَ هَوَى صَاحِبِهِ وَصَاحِبُهُ ظَالِمْ فَبَاعَ آخِرَتَهُ بِدُنْيَا غَيْرِهِ Subhanallah. You know when I said, when you see a group of people on the street doing wrong, what you generally see is one leader, the others are just followers. And this is exactly what he's saying. The most foolish and stupid and the most idiot of people is the one who is pulled by the desire of his companion, 
who is driven not by his own desire that okay you've got some fulfillment is your desire is a desire of your friend what you perceive as your friend his friend is an oppressor he is a wrongdoer hence this person sells his akhirah for somebody else's dunya think over that we're selling our akhirah for somebody else's dunya here what kind of a deal is that then the Khalifa said, now Khalifa finished his questions. He said to him, Ya Aba Hazim, why don't you join me? Come along with me. Stay in my company. I can benefit from you like this. And you can also benefit from me. I'll spend on you. Essentially, that's what he's saying. Kalla Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. Never, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. No way. Khalifa says, Walima, why not? What's, what's so bad about that? Why not? Akhsha an arkuna ilaykum qalilan. Akhsha an arkuna ilaykum qalilan. Fayudhiqan illahu di'fa al-hayati wa di'fa al-mamat. Ya Allah. He said, my fear is if I stayed with you, I would start becoming inclined to your ways. Because you generally take on whoever you sit with. You take on their attitude. I will become inclined to you even slightly and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will start to give me double of the benefits of this world and then give me the double problem at death look how clear he is no ulterior motive except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then the Khalifa says fine fine what do you need tell me what you need and I'll fulfill it for you Abu Hazim remained silent he didn't answer him the Khalifa persisted. No, you need to tell me, I need to do something for you. He said, whatever it is, I'll do for you. He says, I've got one. The need I have is that you deliver me from the hellfire. Certificate of freedom from the hellfire and entry into paradise. Ticket to paradise. Khalifa said, that is something I can't do. That is something is not within my bounds, O oh, Abu Hazim. So Abu Hazim says, Mali min hajatin siwaha, ya Amir al Mu'minin. I have no other need except that. I have no other need except that. Now you understand who the Ulul al Bab are. If Allah doesn't give us that level, we pray He does, but at least He extends our level to something higher than where we are and we get closer to this. And then Abu Hazim, he said, uh, he, Khalifa said, Oh Abu Hazim, make dua for me. You know, we tell people, Ud'u liya Abu Hazim, make dua for me. Immediately, he started making a dua. Now listen to this dua. Until now, the ministers have been all watching, not saying anything, not maybe even understanding. But the Khalifa knew what was going on. He said, this is the dua he made. He said, Allahumma in kana abduka Sulaiman min awliya'ik, fayassirhu ila khayray dunya wal akhirah. وَإِنْ كَانَ مِنْ أَعْدَائِكَ فَأَصْلِحْهُ وَهْدِهِ إِلَى مَا تُحِبُّ وَتَرْضَى What kind of boldness? He said, O oh Allah, O oh Allah, if your servant Sulaiman, Sulaiman is from your wellies, your close ones, your friends, then make the best of this world and the hereafter good for him. And if he is from your enemies, then guide him, reform him towards the way that you love and that you're satisfied with. That is when somebody from one of his ministers, he got up and he said, Bi'sama qult, Bi'sama qult, Mundu dakhalta ala Amir al Mu'mineen. Since the time you've come to speak to Amir al Mu'mineen, this is uh, so bad things that you've been saying to him, all of these insults and everything that you've been saying to him. Just, just uh, two more minutes, we'll finish this quickly. Then after that, he said, to him, he, said, he said, you've made the Khalifa of the Muslimin, you've made him one of the enemies of Allah. Is that what you're saying? That he's one of the enemies of Allah? You will look how much you're irritating him. Abu Hazim said, no, bi'sama qulta anta. You're the one who's saying the bad things here. You're the one who's saying the wrong things. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken an, a, a covenant with the ulama that they must say the truth wherever they are. They must say the truth. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِنَّا, لنناس, You will make it very clearly. You will explain it clearly and you will not hide the truth. That's what Allah has told us to do. And that's exactly what we're doing. And then he turned to the, uh, the Khalifa and he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, those people who have passed before us, they used to have among them, they, they, used to be, they used to have goodness among them. And the reason is that their ulama used to benefit their, uh, used to benefit their, their, their khulafa. The khulafa never used to go to the... Uh, 
the, the Khulafa used to like to go to the, the ulama to benefit from them. Right? But then after that, a certain group of people from the lowly class, they began to study the knowledge and then they had selfish motives. So what they started doing is, they started to go to the, the doors of the kings and the leaders and the khalifs and they started to tell them what they wanted to hear, not what they should have heard. And because of that, the ulama, uh, the, the ulama became downtrodden and humiliated and the khalifs, they stopped, the khalifs and leaders, they stopped benefiting from the ulama. So what are you saying to me? And then after that, the Khalif said, he, he's right, to give me some more nasiha. The king is enjoying this. The Khalif is just enjoying. He said, give me some more advice. And then, uh, because he said that I have not seen wisdom closer to anybody else's tongue than your tongue. Right? And, uh, and uh, then he said, this is what the response was. He said, if you are a person who is going to fulfill whatever you heard, then whatever I've said, it's sufficient for you. Otherwise, essentially, I am just, uh, otherwise, it's like I am firing, I'm trying to fire an arrow from a bow that doesn't have a string. Or whatever I've told you, there's sufficient in there. Anyway, after that, he went away. He went away. And then behind him, the Khalif sent this big bag of goodies, you know, gold, silver, whatever it was. Abu Hazim, he, he, he said, I don't even want it for you, O Khalif. How can I want it for myself? Right? And then after that, when, he, when he, they were insisting, he said, he, he said that, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, if these dinars are for my meeting with you, then the whole thing has been a joke. The whole thing has been a joke. I don't want anything to do this because I think this is more haram for me than eating swine when I don't have any food and I'm about to die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us some insight. Allah allow us to recognize and learn from this. Allah make us of the ulul albab. Jazakumullah khairan for our patience. May Allah give for our sacrifice. Wa akhirul da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alam.